Welcome everybody to um, Beers with Bill. This is um, our uh, May the 4th edition. And I'm pleased to welcome Peter Collins from uh, TWB. And uh, Peter, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bill. So we're gonna start with uh, Birds and Bees tonight. You wanna talk a little bit about that before I actually ask you some questions? Oh yeah, for sure, yep. Uh, Birds and Bees is our blonde ale. It's uh, uh, most craft breweries have them. It's sort of our gateway beer. Um, so, you know, those who are coming in might be new to craft beer. Maybe they like Bud Light or Miller or something. So that's, we're going to direct them to the Birds and Bees Blonde Ale. It was one that was uh, sort of developed uh, in partnership a little bit with uh, the Fat Sparrow Group. Uh, that's the Taco Farm, Nick and Nat's. Um, the Stone Crock up in St. Jacobs, uh, all those the restaurants, they wanted something that would, to be on tap all the time uh, that would just pair well with basically everything. So <clears throat> that's in part where the name came from uh, as well, because Fat Sparrow, the birds, and TWB, the bees, the birds and the bees. So it's, uh, it's one that I like. Uh, it's a beer that is, it's simple. I don't really need to think about it a whole lot. It's, uh, you know, it's well balanced. I'll have it on tap at home uh, fairly regularly. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, when you've been doing QC or working with beer all through the day, it's nice to sometimes just have a beer you don't have to really think about. I hear you on that. So Peter, can you, can you share with us the um, sort of the backstory of how you got into being um, you, you made a transition from being a home brewer to being a brewer. Yes. How, how that yeah. transpired. Yeah. Um, so prior to being at TWB, I was at uh, Grand River Brewing uh, down in Galt. Um, <clears throat> so the way that happened, uh, it was basically sort of Labor Day weekend. My youngest daughter was just about to head into school for uh, grade one. Uh, this will come up fairly uh, frequently in this podcast, but in my other life, I'm a professional musician. So uh, on that uh, Labor Day weekend, it was uh, 2008, I believe, um, I walked into the brewery and uh, Bob Hannenberg was there, uh, came into the retail section and he was sort of beside himself and just busy with everything. And uh, I, I'd been in several times before, so I knew Bob <clears throat> and just asked him like, how are you doing? He's like, oh, I have no time for anything. My summer help just left. I, no time for packaging, no time for deliveries, all this stuff. And I just said sort of offhandedly, I, like, I could help you if you want. And uh, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, if you need some help, I can come in. I've got my days free. I'm a freelance musician, but you know, my kids are in school full time now. So just sort of started there. And he said, okay, come in on Wednesday. I did. I came in on Wednesday, <laughs> got me started. And I started uh, with cleaning bottles and cleaning growlers and filling them and cleaning kegs and just started from there and worked my way up through Grand River um, to sort of all departments of various stages and ended up there as head brewer from January 2015 to July 2016 and then was uh, kind of poached uh, by the previous brewer at uh, TWB. He was the he was the head brewer but he was also the president of the co-op and the brewery coordinator. Finding all of that a little too much uh, for one person. Um, so he asked if I would be willing to come and work full time and just be the brewer. So I did. And I ended up there uh, July 2016 and have been there ever since. Thank you. That's um, almost a literal story of like I started washing bottles and worked my way through. So you learn everything yes. about the brewery. Yeah, 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 basically. And it's also a little bit of, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's a little bit of being in the right place at the right time, too. That's, that's important, being in the yeah. right place at the right time. Yeah. So yeah. you alluded to being a, 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 a bass trombone player. And you and I... <laughs> alluded. Been, 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 wait. <laughs> it's like all I've done for the last I, well, 30 years, basically. I haven't seen you play. <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. Many people have, though. Yeah, <laughs> Um, so first question I would ask you about that, what artist would I find on your playlist right now? Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> uh, as far as a sort of a general, 
category because I don't have my playlist right here and I, I sort of flip through. Uh, if we're sort of going to go through a taxonomy of it, it's sort of classical music, of course, generally is what I listen to, uh, but then early music, so music that would be prior to, you know, 1700, 1750. Uh, and then from there, more specifically, it sounds really nerdy, but Italian Renaissance, German Renaissance, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a great sound system at work. <laughs> so I will often just plug in my iPhone and turn on Spotify and literally blast some uh, Italian sacred Renaissance music. And that is super nerdy and super geeky. And sometimes I'll just turn it down a little bit or turn it off when my colleagues come in because it does sound a little churchy in there, but it's fantastic music and it's glorious. So why not? I'm, I'm going to live it. <laughs> Absolutely. It's also, it, it's also stuff that I played a fair bit in my career too. Um, and that was some of the music that I enjoyed the most uh, when I was playing it. So I'll listen to it as well. But classical music generally is what's on my playlist for sure. Hey, I know because when we, uh, you and I were doing the collab, I still remember this. We had the whole realization that, oh, you like yeah. orchestral music. <laughs> You're going to love like... this. And it disappears. And all of a sudden, there it is. Yeah. And that was like very far into the day. I was like, I was not, I was, <laughs> certainly wasn't disappointed, but I was like, oh, I wish I'd known that at the very, very beginning of the day. <laughs> That's true. I'm not sure David, when he came by to, to, to pick up his beer from me, maybe would have appreciated that, <laughs> but, but that, would have right. been, that would have been okay. I get so, all kinds of people coming into the brewery that just kind of look at the sound system and the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> so you, um, you, you went to school in uh, McGill for your yep. uh, undergrad, yep. and then you have played in a lot of different venues. I'm wondering, what's your most favorite venue to play in? Uh, well, I can tell you, yeah, I did a little bit of research on this because my memory is terrible generally, but, uh, one thing for sure, I've been very lucky, um, shortly after getting out of school, I got a job, uh, playing with the Hamilton Philharmonic and, uh, the hall there in Hamilton is fantastic. So I've been lucky that the last, you know, 25 to 30 years or so I've played in that hall very, very regularly, uh, every season. Um, but there were a couple of standout halls that I've played in uh, down in the U.S. Uh, I used to play with a group called Apollo's Fire in Cleveland, and I did a couple of tours with them. And uh, the last one, actually, yeah, the last one that I did, the last venue that we played in was um, a concert hall called uh, Bing Concert Hall in Stanford. Uh, and... It was amazing. It was just a spectacular visually, uh, a, a visually spectacular hall, um, but also the acoustics in it were in, just incredible. Um, so that was the last concert I did with them. On another tour with them, uh, we played in St. Louis. In the St. Louis, uh, I'm going to get the name slightly wrong, but it, it's the St. Louis Basilica Cathedral uh, in there, which is a massive, massive uh, cathedral um in st louis and the acoustics were uh i wouldn't necessarily say ideal but the reverb in there i think we calculated was like eight seconds i don't think it was quite into double digits but the reverb was just unbelievable uh and a massive massive space to play in and just breathtaking visually on the, the inside as well um so those two were sort of a couple of career highlights, but I, like I said, I've been lucky to have that uh, time with Hamilton Philharmonic in that hall consistently. And that's, it, it is one of the best halls in Ontario for sure, if not Canada. Definitely one of the best, well, it is the best in Ontario. And the, <laughs> the Basilica in St. Louis is fantastic. I have been there. Yeah. I have not had the opportunity to sing there, but I have been there. Yeah. And yeah. just, it's an impressive space. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, we were lucky. Um, just a couple of us. We, we talked with uh, one of the sort of caretakers who was there, one of the, the gentlemen who was looking after us in the orchestra. And uh, he was able to take us up into the, uh, the loft area of the cathedral. So which the, 
the yes. size of the inside of this place is is massive so we were way up high it was just incredible got to yeah. walk around up there for a little bit that yes it's quite the view from up there so i do have to ask because we have um keith carmen and nick bear both who are punk rock artists and yeah. we're we're contemplating putting together a kickoff annex punk rock band so do you okay. think <laughs> the bass trombone would fit in with a punk rock group um yes <laughs> uh because this is one that i also researched too but there's punk ska so ska bands with yeah. trombones and horns in them and punk so there you go like a punk ska band with a horn section yeah i can see I david hussey's like yes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> okay there it is yeah dread zeppelin that's good yeah, yeah. And I do play, um, I was going to say, I play a little tenor, which relative to bass is a little instrument. Um, but I have a, I have a tenor trombone at home, so I could play it if we needed to. It's actually, it's a, a type of trombone that's called a P-bone, and it's plastic, and it's red, and it's awesome. <laughs> I'm just picturing that. I am just picturing that. Now, we, we spoke last night a little bit about um, the backstory around when Elizabeth Thompson, the granddaughter of uh, John Moore, which is yeah. the, 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 the owner of the Preston <clears throat> Hop Yards, were there, which is really the launching of, of uh, a unique style, well, not a unique style, but a, but a um, um, cream ale that you guys produced and mm -hmm. in the sort of launch of the Tavistock Hop Farm. Want right, to talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Kyle uh, Winnett, uh, who's the owner of the Tavistock Hop Farm, uh, he got in touch with me a, a fair ways back when I was at Grand River Brewing. I think about my last year there. Um, not only for selling me hops, but he had a strain that he was interested in trying out um, at a brewery. It was he called it the Heritage uh, Hop Strain, and uh, what he had done was. Uh, Kyle, so uh, I live in Preston in Cambridge, um, and the where the Grand River is in Preston and where the Speed River is in Preston, this area here used to be one of the largest hop farms uh, in North America at the turn of the last century. So you can still go onto the trails near the river and find hop plants growing, and they produce cones and the whole bit. So he actually went and he uh, grabbed a couple of those and grabbed the rhizomes and uh, cultivated them and grew them up into uh, a few rows on his farm and called them the heritage hop uh, strain. So when I was at Grand River, I didn't have quite the flexibility that I do at TWB. So I wasn't really able to do anything uh, with what he was offering at that time. Um, but then I came to TWB and after about a year or so, I think uh, he got in touch with us or we got in touch with him. him um, to buy hops uh, just generally, because uh, he's a local producer, which is great. Um, he brought up uh, the idea of the Heritage Hop again. And then everything kind of blew up from there in a fantastic, weird, kind of coincidental way, because where I live in Preston is just blocks away from where Kyle grew up. Uh, I also live at the corner of Westminster and Moore Street, Moore being the owner of those hop farms. Um, and then the other brewer who was there uh, at the same time I was, uh, Colm Kennelly, he, he used to live in Kitchener on another Moore Street, same family, another area of hop yards uh, in the region a uh, hundred or so years ago. So there's the three of us, Kyle and I having sort of lived in the same neighborhood, right near Moore Street, the other brewer living on Moore Street in Kitchener, this heritage hop strain, it was like a match made in heaven, as it were. Um, so we decided that we would do something with that. And we uh, built a recipe uh, called Heritage Cream Ale using primarily this heritage hop strain. And then on that brew day, uh, Kyle was amazing with the promo for it. Uh, he contacted um, descendants of uh, the Moore uh, hop farm got archival maps and photographs and all kinds of stuff, uh, brought in other hop farmers on the day, 
And uh, it was quite a thing. It was really very interesting. Which beer are we going to go to next? Uh, solo. Solo. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll get mine. I'll be right back. fun. This is only the second time I've tried it in a finished state. <laughs> in a finished state. Okay. Yeah. Well, I tried it. I sampled the word as we were brewing it Yep. or after we brewed it and tried it uncarbonated, unfinished uh, during transfers and then had to sample the finished product for carbonation levels and stuff. It's okay. Do you like it? came out exactly the way I kind of envisioned it happening okay good <laughs> that's uh i'll take it i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> well no you 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 and i traded emails back and forth about what yeah. style of beer we would do and how we would go about it and um we couldn't get apollo hops remember right. that yeah because they yeah. weren't they weren't they weren't readily available so we went with galaxy yeah. And uh, I said, well, I've always wanted to know what would happen if you boiled Galaxy for a full boil and then yep. put some in just at the last three minutes and then dry hopped it later. Yep, that's exactly what we did. And that's, yep. you know, and this has come out exactly the way I envisioned it. Yeah, yeah. Relatively simple grain bill. I think it was just, uh, give me two seconds. I'm just going to pull up the recipe here. It was... Uh, Two row and um, oh, a little bit of Munich and a little bit of Crystal. Yeah, I was shooting for a um, West Coast IPA and uh, didn't quite get there, but we got a nice APA uh, with a fair punch of bitterness up front, uh, simply because we <laughs> sort of added hops enough for a West Coast IPA and, and came in a little low. So there's a it's not an unpleasant amount of bitterness up front, and uh, it's a good, good hop flavor, good mouthfeel overall. I like it. Um, so I, I will. I mean, for those who are not sort of in the know for the, any of the background, um, Bill contacted me about doing this podcast and uh, gave me some details and gave me the date. And that's like, that's May the fourth. We should have a May the fourth beer for the the podcast. And uh, so we figured on doing a collab and we worked it out and got the date and did all that. Uh, then the next part for me is naming the beer, uh, which is often the worst part for me because I'm terrible at naming beers. It's a running gag at uh, the brewery that any beer that I'm going to name is simply going to be TWB plus the style of the beer. And then I'm done and but <laughs> we needed more so <laughs> bill and i went back and forth and some of my colleagues at work who went back and forth on the name um because it's may the fourth i finally came up with solo or of course han solo and and i think it's ben solo ben solo somebody yeah. will help me out somebody will correct me um and so of course that ties into may the fourth it's also a single hop brew as solo and then the other thing was that i was shooting for a west coast ipa but my numbers came in so low that it turned out to be an apa so sort of ties in a few different ways there well i had fun brewing it that's all i'm gonna say yeah it was yeah, a, well, so did I. <laughs> you know, it's we, rarely not fun brewing we overcame a couple of uh issues in the process Nobody got hurt. And nobody died. So. Yeah, we didn't blow the building yeah. up. So, nope. And we, we ended beer. up with a beer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, 
in Derek, if you want to store it at that temperature, feel free to do it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just reading that now. I'm not totally paying attention to this chat, but there's it, lots of good questions and comments there. <laughs> Frozen in carbonate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm leak. If you back under. <laughs> So Peter, is there any beer you haven't brewed that you wish you had brewed? Um, well, all of them. <laughs> I, I asked this question to a friend of mine and it was like, well, what beers haven't you brewed? I'm like, well, there's an infinite number of beers that I haven't brewed. There's a very finite number of beers that I have brewed. Um, but the, what I was thinking was that it wasn't necessarily anything specific, but um, a beer that gets brewed or yeah, the ones that came to mind were something like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale or Pilsner Urkel, a beer that gets brewed that becomes a flagship for a particular style. I think that would be kind of cool and not even necessarily commercially successful. But, but, I mean, that's unquestionable Pilsner Urkel and Sierra Nevada Pale Ale are commercially successful, but when you talk about an American pale ale, that Sierra Nevada pale ale is a flagship of the style. When you talk about a Pilsner, Pilsner Kel is a flagship for that style. It would be cool to brew a beer like that, that becomes so renowned that it is it becomes synonymous with the style. It's a good answer. I was not one I was looking for, <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. All right. Yeah. So with everything that's happened over the last year, and I mean, you know, as, as a brewer, maybe not as problematic as the front front end staff, but how do you stay grounded with everything that's gone on through COVID? That's a good question too, because it's not everything that's happening at work that's keeping me grounded. Routine definitely keeps me grounded. That is, um, it's something that I <laughs> appreciate in my daily life is routine. Um, but uh, as cheesy as it might sound, family has definitely kept me grounded. Yeah, that's right. um, I don't know if you heard my wife say that in the background. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, but they've been here, you know, every day uh, at home with my wife and my younger daughter, who's 19 now. Um, they've been here the entire time. And, you know, it's sort of, it's my happy place when I'm done at work, I can come home and I know that everybody's here and that sort of kept me grounded at, at work. If, if, if anything, it is just the routine knowing that, you know, I'm coming in, it, it's a good place to work at TWB and the people there are good, uh, good people to be with. Uh, it was a little bit tricky early on in the pandemic because we were sort of um, siloed uh, into teams. Um, and for better or worse, my team was me because I'm the only brewer there. Uh, we did have sort of two people for a packaging team and a, and a couple of those and sort of uh, people working together who were always together only in that team. But I was sort of on my own. And uh, there were many, many days working just on my own with no contact with anybody. And that was, you know, routine is good, but it's not bad to have contact with people. So operating in a vacuum can be a little bit tricky. You know, appreciate that. What's been the hardest hurdle for you to overcome during COVID? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Um, Cause there's like many, many different things. Uh, at the brewery, there were a few things over a period of about six months that like random uh random issues with beer random like fermentation problems that were it was just like i remember talking to another brewer uh, from another brewery around that time and he was like the same thing is happening at our brewery it's like just random weird stuff you know stalled fermentation or quality issues or whatever and there was like seemed to be no reason uh, for it uh that was a struggle for a while um Aside from brewing, the other thing that I struggled with was in sort of my music world, that industry has been basically shut down uh, since the start of the pandemic uh, because of no gatherings. So there's no live music, there's no concerts. Um, 
so many of my friends and colleagues, many who are in you know partnerships with other musicians, um, they yep. don't have a steady income right now. I've been very lucky over the last year to to be able to have TWB as a full time job, um, so in place or alongside of a, a music career. So when that music industry got shut down, I still had something to do um, and earn a living and feel sort of somewhat useful day in and day out. But many, many of my friends and colleagues did not have that. That was very, very hard for me to watch and sort of stand by and, and see that. Yes, I can imagine. What's been the best outcome through COVID? Or the best change because of COVID? At TWB, I think the best change has been the switch to sort of the online ordering and deliveries. That was a very quick flip, um, done very well by mainly one of our colleagues, one of my friends at the work, James Lamb, um, within the period of about a day, I was able to flip everything over to online ordering and uh, we were able to set up deliveries and curbside pickup and all that. That's been a, a good positive thing overall because in all of the the back and forth of lockdown and open up and patio and no patio and all of that we've been able to maintain that online presence which has been great um but then overall as well the the flexibility of the the team at pwb that we're not just one person running the show uh, because we're worker owned we do have a fairly expansive team where there are many of us doing different things so we're able to to make all those flips and and have that flexibility within the brewery. Derek asked an interesting question. He wants to know whether we did an in-person collab or a remote collab. And uh, we kind of did a hybrid because you and I communicated back and forth quite a bit before yeah. we set the brew date. And then, you know, I showed up at nine o'clock to the brewery masked and social distance and we had the back door open and yeah. You know, you watch us having a conversation and we'd be 10 feet apart talking with yeah. each other. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's a large space in the brewery. Uh, so with that back door open, uh, which we had to have anyways, because we were using a propane burner. Yeah. So we were close to the door, basically outside. But yes, distance and mass the entire time. Yeah. So that'll answer your question, Derek. <laughs> Well, the other half was, was there anything about COVID that made it particularly memorable or interesting or difficult, aside from just having to wear masks and stay far apart? The music. That's a good answer. <laughs> Peter, do you have something to add to that? <laughs> no, no, it was a, a good, solid collab brew day. I, I, again, I wish we had spoken about music much earlier in the day, because that would have been amazing. Uh, but uh, it was it was good what we had. Yeah. Remind me the next time just you and I are doing something as a collab or in a space, and I will tell you about meeting Daniel Berenbaum. Okay, awesome. What's your favorite style of beer to brew? This is a funny one too, because in most cases, the easy answer is my favorite style to brew is my favorite style to drink. So I love, you know, all these hazy IPAs and New England IPAs and, and all that. So I do enjoy brewing those, but there is a little part of me that is the lazy brewer, uh, which is like my favorite beers to brew are the ones that <laughs> require the least amount of work. So there are some recipes <laughs> that I have, some that I've developed, but others that the previous brewer developed where... You know, the grain bill is like the most immediate example is the blonde ale. The blonde ale is not a large grain bill because it's only five, five, three percent. Uh, so it's not a large grain bill. The hop schedule is quite simple and, and easy, and there's a fair bit of time in between a lot of the steps. So it's, uh, it's a nice brew day doing the blonde because uh, it's a fairly relaxed. Wobbly Wheel is not bad either. It's one of my favorite beers. We're coming to it, I think, next. Yeah. Um, but 
wobbly wheel is nice too because it's actually it has similar characteristics even though the day is a little bit longer because we do instead of a one hour boil we do a 90 minute boil but there's actually not a whole lot of um uh, active time during that 90 minute boil i have to dig out the mash time and and that's fairly laborious but there's no rush in doing it uh so it's a i like those kind of brew days I don't know if that, I don't know if that's a legit answer. <laughs> I I think that's lazy, a perfect, lazy brewer. Uh, perfectly legit answer. What you like to yeah. brew are the beers that you like to drink, and yeah. the beers yeah. that are the easiest, from a perspective of grain bill and hop bill. Sure. Yeah. Those, those there's, a, there's a lot of there's a lot of days in the brewery where it's it's fairly busy and there's a lot of stuff going on and every once yeah. in a while when you've got a brew day that's like, ooh, we can just sort of relax a little bit. It's it's okay. You know, and yet, when you say that, what comes to mind in my head is, is the easiest beers to brew are also the ones you can't make mistakes on. Because oh, yeah, the, sec yeah. the second you make a mistake, you can't cover it with anything. That's right. Yeah. You know, so you, yeah. you, as, as much as it's easier to brew, you got to pay a lot more attention. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know? absolutely. So, so before we go to Wobbly Wheel, which is the next one, um, what do you see that's new and exciting happening in the, beer, in the uh, craft beer industry right now? Um, there's, there's all the, I mean, it's not right now, but I guess over the last year or so, the, the seltzers, the hop waters, um, that kind of thing, I think is new and interesting. Um, I find it kind of curious. Uh, we don't, we don't make them, I guess, yet. Maybe I should take a stab at them. Um, that and the sort of the move to low ABV beers um or and like fairly low abv beers uh and that i have done a little bit over the last year uh, a couple in the sort of three to four percent range um and yeah keeping them light i like uh i still like those beers to be like because i like hops the hops are my thing so i still like those low abv beers to be you know a lot of hop aroma and hop flavor um so that's kind of what i've done with those um yeah the seltzers there was one other thing it, it'll come to me yeah. we did talk about slushy beers the other day yes we did <laughs> yeah i did try one i tried a couple we have a weekly sort of team meeting and uh during those meetings we do qc and uh the qc varies from our own products uh, that have been uh, set aside for QC, or sometimes we do side by sides. Like one time we did, coming back to Pilsner Kell, we did our Pilsner beer uh, side by side with Pilsner Kell. Um, but there was one time that we did bring in a couple of slushy beers, uh, and I can't remember where they were from. Somebody else brought them in. Um, they were interesting. There, there's no doubt it's an interesting thing. It's not something I'm going to sit down and drink three pints of. Um, it's not that kind of beer, but we had a few sample glasses of them and, and it's still beer, but it's, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to say they're weird because <laughs> it's like, and not in a bad way. It's just, if somebody presented it to me and said, here, have this beer, I'd be like, that's a weird beer because the viscosity is, it, there's so much to it. Uh, there's not a whole lot of carbonation it's all like just kind of weird to to see and to drink yeah. so you're gonna go grab the wobbly wheel and when yes. you get back we'll talk a little bit about it and then i'm gonna get to a question that graham just threw up okay Uh, so I am seeing on the chat uh, info, which I think I believe is James um, from the brewery. So he says they were third moon beers. Yeah. Well, 
the guys at Third Moon were doing a really great job with the slushies. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of a signature beer for them. Yeah, yeah. So why we will? Yeah, uh, it's our flagship IPA. It's, uh, I guess, sort of a new world IPA, but it's not a West Coast IPA. There's not that punch of bitterness at the front. Um, a lot of our beers don't have that bitterness in there, <clears throat> uh, in part because that's, that, so that's a slight tangent here. There's sort of two sets of beers that, that are happening at TWB. There's the beers that I sort of adopted because I came in after we opened. So those sort of legacy or flagship beers, those were very, very well brewed and, and dialed in by the previous brewer column. And then there's basically my recipes or the recipes that I did in conjunction with column. So there's sort of those two sets of beers. This is the former. Um, so this is one that I sort of adopted uh, when I came on the TWB. <clears throat> so there's very little upfront bitterness uh, for any sort of brewing geeks that are out there. The amount of hops that we use uh, at the beginning of the boil. So we actually do a first word addition. Uh, I'm knocking out about 750 liters of beer. That first word hop addition is three ounces of Columbus. So it's a high alpha hop, but it's only three ounces in the 750 liters. The rest of the hops get added uh, in the Whirlpool. And at that point, I believe it's about five, roughly five pounds of hops into the whirlpool. So that's where the hop aroma and flavor is coming from. Um, so it's not a lot of bitterness, but a lot of hop flavor and aroma in this one. Um, and uh, a good balance with the, the amount of body in the beer. Uh, we're not using, I mean, to get the color, we're using a little bit of a honey malt in there. <clears throat> but of course, it's mostly uh, uh, two row and a little bit of wheat in there as well. Yeah. So, so Graham's curious, in our post-pandemic world, which is way down the road yeah. in most people's minds right now, um, what do you think the craft beer industry is going to keep and what do you think they're going to go back to sort of pre-pandemic wise? Um, what are they going to go to and what are they going to go back to? Well, you're definitely going to keep the direct to customer sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, can't, I cannot see that ever going away now that you, now that we've opened that that door. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and on both sides of it. I mean, when I've ordered beer, it's one of the greatest things. Somebody shows up at my front door and drops off a case of beer. I love this. This is great. Um, so yeah, I don't think that's going to go away. Uh, I'm hoping there's going to be a real surge post pandemic of just people coming back out to the brewery to the patio, to the tasting room, whatever form that takes for us in a post-pandemic world. Um, and I hope there's gonna be a big rush and I hope there's gonna be, I hope it's gonna be last a little while uh, at least. Yeah. I do, sorry, this is going back to the previous question um, before we brought out the wobbly of uh, what's new uh, in, the, in the brewing world. Uh, it's what's new is what's old. Uh, that there's there's a was a trend for bringing the West Coast uh, IPAs back, uh, which we talked about when we were doing the collab, um, yep. and some of the sort of the styles from the the '90s and early 2000s uh, that were sort of popular. Who does the artwork for GWB? Um, we have a couple of graphics people uh, at TWB. One is one of the worker owners, uh, Rob Shorney. Um, so he's been with us since the beginning. He's one of the original six worker owners. Um, the labels, like you see on the Wobbly Wheel and the Birds and Bees, those, uh, those are Rob's uh, creations. Uh, we have another person who's our communications coordinator, uh, Lisa Umholt, and uh, she does uh, some of the artwork as well for us. Uh, so just thinking back, the uh, the Krampus four pack that we did around Christmas time with the, the picture of Krampus and then there was the name and the style of the beer. Uh, those were her 
uh, creations and the fall four pack with the uh, Westphalia, Alt Beer, uh, the Collision Course, um, and two others. <laughs> I'm just drawing a blank right now. Uh, she did the artwork on, on all of those. So they're very different styles, but they work well uh, for us at TWB for all the beers. Eric's curious if you're ever going to build a uh, tunnel between yourselves and Short Finger Brewing. <laughs> uh, I think he's just getting lazy because he has to pedal that bike with the with the baby carrier on the back. Yeah, yeah, that can be a chore. I, I can understand that. Uh, that hill sucks. Which, <laughs> which hill? <laughs> Sterling Street Hill. Sterling Street Hill, the one over the railway tracks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel for you. I've run over that. So it's, in here. Uh, it could be a tour. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll bring it up with Rob at Short Finger and we'll talk about a tunnel. Yeah. And then you'll have to get the guys in between you that own the old Snyder's property to agree to yeah, let you see, drill under there. Do you see how much big equipment they have over there? They could do that now for us. Yeah. They definitely could. But will they? <laughs> uh, beer is currency. Yeah. Graham's curious what's going to happen in the tap room. Is it going to remain the same? Is it going to get larger when things go back to the new normal that we're going to run into eventually? Uh, that we're kind of working on. Um, I don't think the tasting room uh, will be, I think that front tasting room will not be much of a thing. It's just too small. Once you get more than a few people in there, the distancing is not really possible. Um, so we do have the uh, the brewery space out back, which is uh, a lot more spacious. Um, and we do have a loft slash mezzanine area in the brewery as well uh, that we can use. Um, and both those spaces allow us a good distancing currently um, and, uh, you know, a reasonable, reasonable space to be in. So hopefully that will be a thing. But, you know, then we're coming up on patio season right now. So we're hoping that as of the, the long weekend in May, we'll be able to, to be back out there, depending on what our wonderful government says about opening up or locking down or whatever the next move is. That's true. It will be up to them what, what happens for us. Yeah. So tell me, what, yeah. what's next for TWB? Getting over this pandemic thing. Um, we're looking at uh, not necessarily an expansion of the space, but... Um, Last year, one of the things that sort of crippled us a little bit was when we did uh, have the flexibility and a little bit of the fast tracking from the city for the patio. Uh, one of the things they had to do was come in and inspect uh, our facility and make sure that our plans for the patio matched uh, what we were doing physically versus what they had in hand on paper. Um, and at that inspection, uh, they discovered or uh, figured that we didn't actually have a maximum occupancy that was declared uh, for our facility. So at that time, they declared it. So they said, you have one bathroom. So your maximum occupancy for patio and inside is 10 people. So that was a bit of a blow when we were trying to sort of get through pandemic stuff and just serve beer to people. Uh, we have had for uh, a couple of years now, um, another unit that's uh, three down from us. So we're in unit one uh, at 300 Mill Street and we also rent unit four. So it has additional bathrooms. We have since uh, added a bathroom. So we have two available bathrooms plus a staff bathroom in there now. So another inspection last year with another bathroom in unit four allowed us to double our capacity uh, up to about 20 uh, for patio and inside. And we're hoping that with the additional bathrooms this year that we'll be able to further increased capacity. So more people on the patio. We've got a few plans to make the patio space um, a little bit nicer this year with the addition of another sea can and sort of converting that into sort of uh, a service area uh, rather than just having to get your uh, beer from inside and walk outside. Uh, we should be able to serve from out there. Uh, so that sort of just not necessarily an expansion of the space, but hopefully an expansion of our capacity so that we can serve more people and serve them better. What's going to happen next for Peter? <laughs> uh, 
I, don't I mean, hopefully know. you're going to get back to playing music in the near future. I would future. really, really love to. There's nothing wrong with working at TWB full time, but I did have a, a decent career freelancing. Uh, last year, 2020, I was booked uh, at Stratford for the season. So I was going to be doing some of the fanfare work. Uh, and I did have an onstage uh, part uh, playing bass trombone. Uh, I think I was going to be in Hamlet on stage. Uh, so that was going to be my season last year, plus the various freelancing and Hamilton Phil and I teach uh, at Western as well. So I would love for all of that to come back somehow, but it's not going to come back quickly and it's not going to come back in the same way as it did before. Um, the thing I sort of fear a little bit, especially as a freelancer, is that, you know, March 2020, that was the end of my career. That's something I fear. That that's it. That it's done. I'm not coming back. Uh, only because I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the orchestras have been struggling. They were struggling before. I mean, the, the arts is not a money making industry, right? So to have a pandemic come along and basically shut everything down for that has, has been brutal. So for me, as far as that goes, uh, I would love to get back to music, but I don't know if it's going to happen. It, it's one of these things that's like, it's going to have to, I'm going to have to come back differently if I want to do it more, do more solo stuff, small groups, chamber things, that kind of stuff. Um, but it will come back because people want it. People want to listen to live music in whatever form that takes, whether it's, you know, a punk rock band or you know a singer songwriter on stage or a full orchestra or whatever form that takes for for what you want to listen to people want that and the musicians desperately want it as well yeah. they want to perform it's it's in us to to do that so you did a you did a another collab um the apollo cinnamon's galaxy quest the black ipa which is our next beer so, oh, should I go get that now? Does that's that up to you. Cue? That's up to you. <laughs> that, that sounded like a cue. I have to pull up the recipe for this one again. Uh, yeah, okay. So part of the reason I pulled uh, this one for sampling was because uh, it is a little bit similar to, to what we did, only in the sense that it does have galaxy hops in it. Uh, this was a collab with the Apollo Cinema. Um, Kara, uh, who uh, heads up uh, operations there, and I think she's owner or part owner, I'm not sure. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. I saw her just last Friday because we're partnered with them for the popcorn. Um, so I went to pick up some popcorn from her uh, last Friday and just had a delightful visit with her. I, I really like her. Uh, her and uh, some of the employees at the Paula Cinema came for a collab brew day pre-pandemic. Um, I think it was last January or the January before, or the fall before. It's all blurred now. Uh, but uh, they came. It was a great, great brew day. Um, we wanted to use, again, because it was the like Apollo Cinema, um, space related galaxy hops were sort of a go to again uh, with that. Um, the naming of the beer was uh, put out to social media on Instagram with a poll. Um, we at TWB, our brew house or our boil kettle is a machine or a unit, however you want to call it. We affectionately call it Sputnik uh, because of the legs and the knobs and whatnot on it. Just make it look like a, you know, Cold War kind of satellite like Sputnik. So some of the names that were being tossed around, uh, the space race, um, I think Saturn V was one that was tossed around. 
but Apollo and Sputnik, that was a pretty, pretty awesome combination for a collab brew day. Uh, and it went to social media and Galaxy Quest was the one, one of the ones that was suggested and that was one that won. Um, so it's a pretty simple grain bill. Um, it, two row, uh, some midnight wheat and some carafoam. Hops are Columbus Chinook and a whole lot of Galaxy and uh, Whirlpool and uh, Galaxy only for the dry hop. Um, for the, uh, again, for the brewing geeks that are out there, one of the things that I like, or one of the things that's difficult about doing a black IPA is the fact that those darker malts that you use uh, can really, really dominate the flavor. The roastiness and the astringency from them can really uh, overpower any hops that you're using. And brewing some black IPAs in the past, it's almost been a waste of hops because it's just not coming through. So one of the things I do with this beer that's, uh, I think, unique in the dark beers that I do is I actually add the darker malts, which is midnight wheat only in this case, add it right at the end of the mash. So it's contributing really mostly only color and not the roasty or astringency notes that um, dark malts can contribute if they're in for the entire uh, length of the mash. Um, so it's a little bit of a trick. So it's a black IPA and my goal is for it to be an IPA that is simply black, less of the, the roasty and astringent, so astringent notes in it. To say that explains why I'm not getting any back tone, almost smokiness in it. Right. <clears throat> yeah. I, want, I still want those hops to be dominant. That's, yep. that's what it is for an IPA for me. Yep. Who's been the biggest influence in your life in brewing? In brewing. Uh, in oh, brewing we, specifically. we tackle music first then. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> music first? Yeah, do music first then. Okay. Um, biggest influence probably is my first, uh, my uh, prof uh, for trombone in my undergrad. Uh, his name was Ted Griffith. He was the former bass trombonist at the Montreal Symphony. Um, and was a longtime prof at McGill. And um, yeah, just the kind of guy he was and the kind of teacher. He was the right teacher for me at that time. Um, and just had a lot of great advice and a lot of great teaching and has really carried me very far in my music career. Uh, brewing wise, I, I guess it'd be pretty simple. The biggest influence would be uh, Rob Creighton, who's now at uh, Logger Shed in Dundas. Uh, he was the head brewer at Grand River Brewing. Uh, he, I trained up under him. Uh, so he's easily the, the biggest influence on my brewing now. Oh, and then and now. Okay. So then I got to ask the other question. If you could spend a single day either brewing with someone or sharing beer and talking beer who would that person be <laughs> yeah, that's a good one and that's i i don't hate those questions but i find those questions very difficult but it wouldn't be a specific person um it would be I, i'm really fascinated by like really really early brewing like thousands of years ago when like not that they didn't know what was going on but they had a different idea of what was going on i think it'd be really curious and cool to sit down and uh, like have two brew days have a brew day with somebody from thousands of years ago who was brewing beer and what they were doing and then if you time travel and have a brew day with them on modern equipment and like that see the similarities and differences and see what see what was going on I think it'd be kind of cool. And then I'd have them be like, you know, time traveling forward in time. It's like, this is beer. This is not at all what beer is, <laughs> right? That big difference in, in processes and end product. Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, we, we brew high, much higher alcohol beers now than what most people would have brewed back then. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. And um, you know, water quality is uh, a bigger issue than it was in the past. Yeah, so. everything. So yeah, that, I could see where that would be intriguing to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, archaeology brewing, yeah. 
What do you think is one of the smartest things the craft beer industry has done in the last year? Uh, stay alive. <laughs> it's also been the hardest thing to do too. Yeah, yeah. Um, the smartest thing they've done, just and like almost every brewery, making that flip to online, uh, trying to trying to maintain that presence uh, out there, trying to stay uh, like uppermost in people's minds. I was going to say in people's face, but that's not the right term, but just stay present for people. Um, I think that's been a smart thing to do. And breweries are doing it in different ways. Um, I don't want to say we're doing it the right way. We've done it a reasonably successful way. Um, because we are still going, um, but uh, lots of breweries are still going, and so lots of lots of people have done that. Just stay present. I'm just going to make note of Remy's statement there about uh, brewing still being an art. There's so much science behind brewing, but there's yes, it's still definitely an art form for sure. Yeah, and yeah. you you show it in the uh, black IPA. You know. Yeah. Thank you. So. You know, who, who, who would have said, I'm just going to put it in right here, right now, just to get color. Yeah, yeah. I've got one last question for you. And that is, what's the one thing you'd like everyone who's joined us tonight for this uh, chat and tasting to take away from our, our chat? Uh, something that hasn't been talked about up to now is just be nice. That's all. It sounds simplistic, but you know, it's not about beer. It's not about music. It's be nice to each other. You know, these are tough times for everybody. It's stressful. Uh, people are losing jobs. People are working in different places, doing different things than they would have done a year ago. And that's wearing on people and the flipping back and forth between <laughs> things being open and things being locked down and stay at home and don't stay at home and gather and don't gather. It's it's burning people out. Uh, so just try and be nice to everybody. Sage advice, Peter. Listen, two things. Thank you for um, being so willing to do that collab with me. That was, oh, uh, that, was, was that was so much fun to do a May 4th collab. Yeah. And thank you for taking this time to uh, share your story and share these beers with us. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Cheers. Cheers. And everybody remind you next week is the first year anniversary of Beers with Bill. And Keith Carmen will be back on joining us, our resident uh, uh, cellar beer expert. That's the way I'm going to describe him. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you next week. Again, Peter, thank you. Thank you. Cheers.